Good afternoon, everyone. Just take your seats. Thank you. My name is Jacqueline Coté. I'm the Director of Public Relations here. And it's my great pleasure to introduce our speaker today, Professor Susanna Hecht. Susanna joined us, I guess, in 2016, that's three years now, as a professor of international history. But she also teaches at the School of Public Affairs in the Department of Urban Planning at UCLA in the US. Susanna is a specialist on tropical development in Latin America, especially the Amazon Basin and Central America. And her research focuses on the political economies of development, ranging from corporate frontiers of cattle and export commodity agriculture to populist land occupation. She also studies their comparative environmental and social impacts. Her recent book, Scramble for the Amazon and the Lost Paradise of, how do we say that, Euclides da Cunha, whom I understand is a very famous Brazilian journalist, but maybe we'll hear more about that, won her several awards, including her best, the best book in Latin American environmental history for the Ameri from the American Historical Association. So Susanna will talk today about the Amaz Amazon fires and more particularly the rise and fall of deforestation, which unfortunately have been much in the, the news lately. And uh, without further ado, I will give uh, Susanna the floor. So as with all our lunch briefings, I'll ask Susanna if you could keep it to maximum half an hour so that there's plenty of time for Q&A and we will close by 1.30. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Well, thank you all for coming and giving up your lunch hour for some rather depressing news. But um, anyway, you can look at it this way. It'll take away your appetite, which we all know is so slimming. Um, the thing that I'd like to talk to you, first of all, let me make a sort of sad announcement, which is that the US is withdrawing from the Paris uh, Climate Accords, which um, is yet another blow to thinking about how we might contain tropical deforestation. And also, this week was a week where there were quite a few massacres of indigenous populations throughout larger Amazonia. So the point is that this is life and death for them and the ending of worlds for them, but it also is in many ways for us. I'm not going to go through a recitation of the importance of the Amazon in terms of its carbon storage and sucking up carbon and, and how many species it has and so on. You can read that anywhere. What I'd really like to talk to you about today is more the dynamics of one, a period in which there was really strong forest conservation at a time when the commodity boom was on, population was pouring in, and yet deforestation was under control. So what was the mystery about how that worked? And then what, you know, this is what uh, scientists and social scientists love. It's called a natural experiment. So you take a situation that is operating in some way, and you change its parameters and watch what happens. So what we have now is we had a very interesting uh, ensemble of mechanisms to uh, control deforestation, and under the new Bolsonaro and slash military regime, this has been drastically changed, and the upshot is what we have been seeing and hearing of late. So without further ado, I'll just go ahead here. Um, one of the things I want to mention that's important, although I'm not going to t go into it very deeply, is that the de Amazonia can't take very much more deforestation before it goes into a tipping point. That, it is, that means to say it goes into a kind of collapse and changes the kind of forest it is. We have about 5% to go. So this kind of accelerated deforestation that we're seeing isn't just a problem for, let's say, those of us who are concerned about falling trees and carbon in the atmosphere, but also a larger question of ecological co collapse. 
This is a very important ecosystem in terms of global climate mediation and regional uh, weather patterns and rainfall patterns. So its collapse has very serious ramifications. And like everything with climate change that we see, it's all going a little bit faster than we thought. You know, climate change, I was supposed to be dead by the time it hit. Not that it, I would be worrying like a fiend about whether my house in Los Angeles would survive the fires. Um, so let me go forward. Um, and here we have, of course, this, this looks like a beautiful forest, and it is a beautiful forest. What you may not be aware of is that this is actually an inhabited working forest. So the point is that you can have forests and you can have livelihoods on the same piece of land. That is, you don't have to separate human livelihoods from the processes of production for markets. This happens to be a, a forest of acai. Uh, how many of you are aware of this Amazonian superfruit? Look, there you go, you see? Um, so just <laughs> keep eating it because, of course, it's been very instrumental in creating an important amount of... Um, of uh, demand and also producing quite a bit of reforestation. Now, I'm, as a historian, I always have to go back and say, well, we have to look at how, how did we get here? How did the thing that existed before operate and why are, is it not operating now? And, uh, whoop, hold on, there we go. Um, one of the things that's important to keep in mind is the end of the dictatorship in, 18, in 1988 uh, the new constitution, which, and 1988 is a year like 1848, or, you know, one of these big, you know, 1968, or the end of the Berlin Wall, which is, I always say is part of 1988. It's the long 1988. But one of the things is a lot of things happened that year that had really strong ramifying effects. We have short memories, but events have long tails. So in this case, one of the things to keep in mind is this was the year of the IPCC founding and where the, Cassand the greatest Cassandra of them all, James Hansen, spoke in front of American Congress about the dynamics of climate change. And it was a really hot summer, so people were inclined to believe him. But of course, we know that later on, it hasn't worked out quite so well. However, the IPCC and the questions of climate change became very imbricated in Amazonian development as it proceeded. And one of the things that did this is through the sort of application of scientific models of climate change and land use change and remote sensing. That remote sensing becomes really important because it begins to be able to monitor deforestation in real time. And this makes all the difference in terms of enforcement of what was called at the time but is no longer environmental crimes. Well, I mentioned the end of the Berlin Wall. Um, it does undid a lot of the socialist thinking. It put the realm of Brazil firmly in the capitalist camp, and it was an end to the Cold War. And so the chits that were being played in Latin America were sort of uh, declined in their importance. What this meant also is that the kind of meddling that had been so much a feature of the earlier period was rather less apparent. Um, and in this sense, Amazonian development took on a rather autonomous feature, which was different from the way that uh, other it had been uh, treated in earlier things, in earlier epochs. The other thing is that China moved in to the world market in a big way. And this will have important implications because China becomes, well, Latin America becomes China's third continent in a way. And also it becomes its largest trading partner, and it certainly becomes Brazil's largest trading partner, mainly through a commodity boom around soy and uh, ore. Also, there was a big shift in macro policy into what we usually call neoliberal styles of development, but decentralization, open to markets, reduction of tariffs, and so on. The other thing that happened, however, and I often say that Amazonia from the period of 1988 on sort of developed, you know, as the, as the unholy offspring of international and environmental politics and neoliberalism. But the point is that it, at the same time where you would almost expect an indifference to environmental laws and environmental uh, impulses because of its market-led uh, dynamics, you had actually quite a bit of emphasis on environment, sustainable development, eco-development, 
uh, those kinds of things. So, and also, increasingly, international loans from the multilateral organizations came with environmental conditionality. Um, and this made a difference. Um, and so also it helped uh, generate a great deal of new, what we might call, institutionalities. And also, this business of new institutionalities took a wonderfully uh, complex form in terms of its, oops, sorry, which is forward, which is back, I don't know. Okay. Um, here we go, uh, and there was, uh, there, so the, these frameworks became very important. Um, the other thing is that um, Amazonia sort of ceased to be sort of a, an autochthonous area in its way, and engaged much more broadly in a series of globalized things, uh, frameworks. These included the human rights framework, I'm gonna have to talk so fast, uh, <laughs> environmental politics as a regional and global enterprise. This is the moment when you really see the globalization of environmental movements and also uh, the question about financial levels and a global political supply chain revolving around environmental questions, not just productivity or returns on investment. And so it's, a, it's an interesting kind of thing. Uh, the Washington Consensus, decentralizes what had been a very centralized authoritarian state. And this becomes important because it permits a certain amount of restructuring at rural, in rural areas and a lot of decision making that moves into these areas in quite innovative ways. And of course, the recognition of historical rights of traditional populations. What this implies in the Amazon development model, as I like to call it, is uh, the idea of multiple modernities. That is, you didn't have to have just one kind of modernity. You could have several different kinds of formats. I put this, uh, oops, sorry. You'd think I would figure this out by now, but it's because the, the white thing is bigger on, the back thing is bigger. Anyway, um, the Constitutional Convention that produced the 1988 Constitution, I put this up because on the one, you have the American Constitutional Convention, which is a bunch of white slave owners. And in this one, you had not only a bunch of uh, Kayapo Indians with whom I worked, but also uh, uh, Kilambolas, traditional populations, a wide variety of different kinds of people. So that constitution was really uh, an, uh, uh, an important um, uh, moment for transformation in these things. So it signaled in a new era. I've given you sort of the, you know, like the, the Walter Cronkite, you are here history of the moment of 1988. But it signaled, as I say, we have short memories, but these events had long tails. One of the things, it, it signaled very large uh, changes in, in institutionalities, in environmental laws. But the other thing that happened was the rise of, let's say, green markets for that acai that we all love, uh, environmental markets for things like um, payment for environmental services. You might have heard red payments for reduced emissions from de deforestation and degradation. A rise of civil society, so extensive social movements, and new kinds of pacts. Um, you could have sort of the green municipios where they would say, okay, uh, if you stop deforesting, we'll give you credits, but otherwise we're gonna black you out. You won't have access to credit. So there were all sorts of innovations that um, I could go on and on for, I'm not going to. But the other thing that was important about this too was new kinds of property regimes. So it wasn't all private property regimes. That sort of was the key hallmark of the Washington consensus. And a rise in green governance of many, many different types. So what does that give you? Well, it gives you this, which is it takes a while to get all that stuff going. And you'll note history always begins in 1988 in Brazil, or at least in the Amazon. And what you can see in this is it goes up and down. But from 2004 to about 2014, the rate of deforestation drops by 84%. So this ensemble of things, there's no silver bullet in this, there's a bunch of different things working in the same direction, gave you an extraordinary dynamic of forest uh, conservation, even as Chinese, the Chinese and East Asia market was going nuts with importing uh, Chinese, um, excuse me, Brazilian soybean, uh, which was going gangbusters, 
like this. I, you get, you know, you, this is an era where you get kind of tired of these, you know, exponential um, <laughs> curves. Can't we just have one that sort of moves up slowly? But no, the answer is no. Um, and what you get with this is sort of how different kinds of policy, re oops, policy regimes kick in. I'll be very operatic here for the moment. But what you can see is that there's an expansion in, in what are called conservation areas, areas uh, protegida, satellite monitoring, so that when you see stuff going, if you see something, say something, and then uh, up comes the Obama people. Blacklisting of top deforesters. They couldn't get any credit anymore. And the soy moratorium, which was uh, the, I don't know, I guess the wolf lying down with the lamb in a lot of ways. But um, in a similar manner, what you can see here is as we're increasing the GDP here, we have a delinking of international commodity production and production and GDP in general from the processes of deforestation. This, of course, is the big dream of eco-development, sustainable development, and so on. Well, what, what they argue here are the big paradigm shifters, mobilization of civil society, monitoring and enforcement, designation of legal areas, and zero deforestation commodities. So uh, the supply, you have a number of things. As I said before, it's not just one animal that comes to the market here. It's an array. Well, what this does <clears throat> is it creates this map. And this is a map that shows about 60% of Amazonia is in some form of conservation or protected area. Um, so the, in this model, you can have inhabited landscapes, like that picture that I showed you that has people in it doing things. Um, it has indigenous reserves, it has uh, sustainable traditional lands, it has extractive reserves, it has a lot of <clears throat> different kinds of things. But what you can see is an extraordinary amount of land-based conservation, which even as we're expanding the GDP and increasing the population from 10 million to 33 million, <clears throat> we're getting extraordinary amounts of conservation at the same time. Now, I don't mean to, <laughs> hold on, oh, I have plenty of time. I can talk slow, I can take a breath now. Um, I was gonna just do it like singing an aria, I'd go on you know, forever. Um, one of the things that's important to realize is that um, this model of the, that I'm showing you actually here also had what, what we call in the business leakage, which is there really was a fabulous amount of control of deforestation in this one area. But that doesn't mean that deforestation stopped. In fact, what happened is that it shifted. And we would know this from some of the things that we would call um, Jevons paradox, that something that's, even if it's efficient, if it's got a long, large market demand, it will move into other areas so that even efficiency and intensification on its own is not enough to stop deforestation. Um, the other thing is that, um, so the Cerrado, the savanna areas were really getting nailed by this. And if I had more time, I would show you beautiful pictures of all of these, but Jacqueline said, it's half an hour and then you shut up. Yeah. So, 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 she, so she has, she's lashed me with this. So instead of entertaining you with the photographs, I can't do that. Um, the other thing is that there are ideologies about landscapes. And Amazonia is particularly iconographic. If I say to you, gee, the Caatinga, it's so fabulous, uh, I think you would say, well, that, that's what you think, Professor Hecht, but I don't know what you're talking about. Um, and it is actually really fabulous. It's an unusual semi-arid forest type that is currently in the process of being destroyed for um, uh, soybean cultivation and uh, spec cattle speculation. If we looked at something like the, what's called the Chiquitania forest, you would say, well, that, is that some kind of cocktail? No, it is a forest type, a semi-deciduous forest type. Um, it's named after the Chiquitano Indians, and it really got nailed in this last deforestation round in August. But the point being that those don't have, they're not, even though they're extraordinarily interesting landscapes, they don't carry the iconographic weight of the Amazon. If I say Amazon, your brains will fill with things. If I say Katinga, you'll say, what is she talking about? Um, 
So one of the things is those symbolic landscapes become iconographic, and the other places become sacrifice zones. Um, so I give, you a, I give you a lovely list, never mind. Um, the other thing is <clears throat> that Amazonia has been apprehended through science. This is, you know, a state of knowledge. You know, that is how we understand from its earliest days it was described ma mainly scientifically in terms of the sciences of the day. I won't go into the intellectual history about the tropicality of Amazonia and how it was shaped by science, but it has this huge scientific apparatus that's associated with it, associated it with it in the past, associated with it now. So that in terms of looking at what happens, there is a coterie uh, of people who can tell you something about it. This is not true of the Caatinga, it's not true of the Cerrado, it's not true of the Chiquitania, it's not true of the Chaco. Those places are, if you will, scientific orphans in a lot of ways. They're orphans in the sense that they don't have much by way of social movements oriented to its development around conserv conserv conserving and preserving nature. Uh, most of the social movements are in the cities, even the ones that are quilombos, which is the runaway slave communities. So what happens is that these areas of leakage are what we used to call pollution havens, um, but these are deforestation havens. They don't have much regulatory apparatus. They don't have, you know, they're not being surveilled like Amazonia is with all those satellites buzzing ahead. Um, they're just sort of sitting there. Uh, there aren't local populations ready to be, ready to resist this. So in a certain sense, they're a, what we would call an open commons and thus uh, vulnerable to a lot of, um, uh, of uh, avoidance of regulation. And the other thing is that <clears throat> the lack of institutional density in these places means that the state isn't there either. So um, a l bunch of large processes of deforestation begin to unfold in these areas while Amazonia is sort of maintained as that sacred grove. Now, as I um, always like to say, scientists love a natural experiment. Um, where you have one thing and it's going like tickety bob and tootling along in its way. And then you change its dynamics and then you see what happens. <laughs> so what we know from leakage is that when you don't have a regulatory environment with scientists and social movements and markets developing and clean supply chains and pacts of various kinds going forward and an active government engagement, that if you don't have that, you get a lot of deforestation, like half of the Cerrado. It's about 100, uh, 100 um, million hectares, so it's a lot. Um, but now what happens is we get Mr. Bolsonaro, who is um, often called the Trump of the tro tropics, but even, even he gives Trump a run for his money. Both of them, for whatever reason, seem to despise nature and embark on a war against it. So. He made this promise in his um, election campaign, which is not one more centimeter for indigenous areas, protected areas, quilombolas, whatever. No, 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 no. It's over. That part is over. So you really, and he kept this promise. Um, if you look at Lula, the previous president, minus two, minus one, he demarcated something like 72,000 kilometers squared. His successor, Dilma Rousseff, about 22,000 uh, kilometers squared, Mr. Bolsonaro, zero. Um, the second thing is he put uh, the indigenous lands under the management at this time, not under the Min Ministry of Agriculture, that was even extreme for him, but moved it into the land, the land agency, um, in, in, and this is the area where demarcation and so on occurs. He basically argues for an assimilationist and indigenous policy. So that multiple modernities that you could be getting your um, Brazil nuts from an indigenous group who would be, you know, some their kids would be studying law, but while they were doing other things. No, that's uh, not really going. But perhaps the most important, and also he began to de de um, what's called de-gazette, which means you, it's, <laughs> you know, it's, it's, it's so British and colonial, um, that basically you take conservation areas and say, well, 
the, this land belongs to us, and we, we decided that it shouldn't be a conservation area anymore. So you just de-gazette it. You can just say, I don't want to do this. Um, but m perhaps his most singular and uh, nerve-wracking uh, pr uh, electoral uh, promise was the idea that he would give amnesty to anybody who did clearing. And so in that sense, what had been in, in environmental crimes became environmental opportunities and having the great potential of taking a public asset and turning it into a private gain, but also with it the possibility of speculative gains, uh, the possibility also of uh, turning it into livestock for a little while. And also, as I mentioned, he was very concerned to regularize title so that, you know, there wouldn't be any of this, you know, tied up in the court's business. He was going to just have the land uh, agency go in and argued that he wanted to regularize the titles of cleared lands, some over 700,000 by the end of the year. The logic, of course, was if you deforest <coughs> um, land that's in a conservation area, you've taken away its conservation value. You've taken 40,000 species of plants and turned them into one, let's say soy or a pasture, or you've taken 100,000 animals and you've made a habitat for one, a cow. So this large-scale transformation really obviates the virtues of these forest systems, both in terms of uh, their biodiversity, but also their livelihoods. So what we have in a certain sense is a kind of a land war going on. But in, in addition to this, um, what he did was uh, taking a page from, uh, well, he didn't need to take a page from his, his environmental minister, Roberto Salas is already so awful that you know, really he, he doesn't need to take a tutoring from anyone. Um, but environmental budgets were cut by 43%. There was the militarization, and there's a large-scale militarization of the entire uh, 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 state apparatus involving nature. Um, so there was the militarization of Obama. The, the, the most, of course, trenchant thing is when the uh, head of INPI, which is the monitoring space agency of Brazil, which is world-class, came to Mr. Bolsonaro and said, you know, <laughs> deforestation's up by 200%. He said, You're <laughs> in that inimitable tone that we now have become associated, has come associated with someone else, you're fired. So that was that for Mr. Galvão. Um, there was threatening of staffs. There was also a total defunding of the equivalent of the National Science Foundation and drastic university cuts, more than 40%. So we're starting to see a sort of, oops, excuse me, uh, uh, a, de uh, a destruction of, ooh, I really have got to quit, uh, but I'm, I'm sorry, I'm almost done. Um, anyway, uh, this gives you an idea. You, you can see a destruction of the regulatory apparatus on multiple levels. So here's the Obama office and car being burned. Here's how many <laughs> um, inspections occurred in Amazonia. A, I think we call this a race to the bottom. But as they say, there's more. Um, it's important to realize that um, uh, the movement, uh, De Freitas, who's the head of FUNAI, the Indian organization, has sided with against indigenous lands and leaders in favor of mining on indigenous lands. The Secretary of State, Mr. Araujo, as well as many others in this administration and evangelicals are an important part of his base. Um, are climate deniers. Um, NGOs were um, derided and accused of being agents of foreign states, and um, funding was suspended, and also basically he, he sort of harassed anyone who got international money. Um, Brazil has yet to pull out of the Paris Accords. I think that he will champ at the bit to do so, and um, as, uh, as he goes uh, forward with this, of course, in great solidarity, Mr. Trump said, if you're going to cut, if you're cutting your forests, your tropical, your humid forests, I can cut ours. And so he put the Tongass National Forest, uh, a rainforest, a temperate rainforest, open to anything that would like to come and cut it down. The ideology really is one of what's called Biblia, 
Boy y Balas, which is the Bible, beeves, and bullets as being the central coteries that are part of his fundamental, um, what do we call it, his uh, um, constituency. Evangelicals, the agro-industrial elites, and, um, and uh, the military and, and militias, which has become, in essence, the sort of operating um, ideological and practical framework. So I'm almost done here. So, once you pull all that off, what do you get? You get a lot of deforestation. It goes right up. Um, it's kind of fun in that way. Um, you can, you know, if you like experiments. Um, and what you can see is, of course, you know, deforestation goes up and down by months, but a rising dynamic of clearing. Um, this was the current fire images uh, in uh, September, and you can see that. Um, uh, uh, that it's kind of uh, in, a, in a lot of conflagrations of over 187,000 fires. And um, the question that you might want to ask is how much ash does it take to have darkness at noon, or actually 3 o'clock, in Sao Paulo, which is more than 1,000 kilometers away from the Amazon? The answer is 6 million hectares. That's what it takes. And that's greater than the annual deforestation globally had been in previous years. And this is what it looks like and looked like. And of course, this was the moment when uh, <laughs> there was a big, uh, at, uh, a big deal of, of outcry over this. But even as perhaps the attention and the news cycle has finished, it's important to realize that the world is maybe not ended for us yet but it is ending for others who are trying to defend these forests. And I'm, um, I'm closing now here with a quote from Euclides da Cunha, my beloved Euclides da Cunha, who wrote some of the most marvelous texts on Amazonia, who said, Amazonia is the last unfinished page of Genesis. Now, the question I have to raise under these current constructs and what we're seeing is whether that last page will be an epitaph. So thank you very much for your patience. And look, I'm almost, I'm only two minutes over. <laughs> so now Oh, is it working? Yes. Such a good ominous sound. <laughs> Thank you, Susanna, for, um, for this presentation, keeping the time. It's uh, relatively doom and gloom uh, at the end of the day. And um, of course, it's not just about Mr. Bolsonaro. But in this room, there are a lot of people working on these issues, and I will give them the floor in a few minutes. But um, before we start, do you see, where do you see the pressure coming from? Uh, is this a question of changing the current uh, uh, administration in Brazil? Is it regulating the multinationals? Is it civil society becoming more active? Uh, where do you see the pressure coming? Well, the G7 can't do anything. What can we do? Well, uh, is this on? Yes? Yes, I guess so. Um, there are a lot of, uh, <laughs> right now in the current configuration and the early days in the Bolsonaro regime, I don't think there are many levers to push um, or to pull. One of the things though is sovereign, there's a lot of investment in Brazil and in deforesting companies and um, so that in a certain sense looking at um, financial levers such as the Norwegians want to do, which is to pull their sovereign wealth funds out of Brazil, um, those, are, those are disconcerting. Um, at, before in the 1980s when there was that big spike in order to push things a little bit, 
the, there was environmental conditionality on uh, multilateral lending. You could imagine a m environmental conditionality occurring on other kinds of financial instruments as being sort of the, f the first thing off the block. The second thing is supply chains. One of the reasons that um, Bolsonaro hasn't left um, the Paris Agreement, according to Blairo Maggi, who had a fit and was writing in the equivalent of the Wall Street Journal saying, do not get out of the, um, uh, of the climate agreement because we'll lose markets. We'll lose the European market. We'll lose parts of the American market. There's bunches of stuff that will happen. And so the geopolitics around this have sort of the, the classic features of international economics more than they do of international environmentalism. Right now, the, if, you, if you believe in the end times, really, what you should do is go for it. You know, get as, grab all the gusto you can, as the Schlitz beer ad used to say. So um, one of the things is I'm not sure that there is that much at this moment you can do in the Brazilian case. And also all Bolsonaro did when the seven or eight Amazonian countries met to discuss deforestation is kind of sneer at them and say, we're not going to let anything stand in the, in the, in the path of our de uh, development. But the other countries were saying, well, you know, it's going to be kind of problematic if we just cut everything down. And also there's a lot of inequality associated with this process. So on one level, one of the things I would think about is where you would want to maybe invest that wasn't in Brazil for the moment, because one, it's, you know, you're, it, it, it will be a hardball thing. Um, second, if you look at where a lot of the investment is coming, it's coming off of, how shall we say, the dark money archipelago in the Caribbean. So you don't really have, you don't know where, who it's coming from and how to control it. But there are other levels, and although Brazil is 60% of Amazonia, there's still a lot of other parts of Amazonia that are more, so, shall we say, amenable to such levers. Thank you. So, over to you. Is there any questions from the floor? Don't be shy. <laughs> okay, these two gentlemen in the front. I'll take one after the other. If you just keep it relatively short and just introduce yourself briefly. Um, good afternoon, everyone. I'm um, Paulo Martins from the Brazilian Mission to the WTO. Um, thank you very much, Professor, for your presentation. Um, I think it's a privilege uh, for us to have someone of your experience and knowledge on Brazilian issues um, to give um, a fair and balanced view of the situation in Brazil and of the Amazon in particular. Um, <clears throat> For all of us that are in the Brazilian Foreign Service, um, the, the last um, couple months um, with the appearance of these outcries were really um, dismaying for us um, because um, for those that are involved in environmental negotiations, um, people know that Brazil from the 1990s onward um, has had a very progressive attitude and um, positioning in international negotiations uh, regarding um, climate change agreements and conservation efforts. So the way that um, <clears throat> Brazilians uh, management of its natural resources were was characterized or mischaracterized in the past few months was very discouraging for us. Um, and I think your presentation showed that in, um, in, um, from a historical perspective, we have been quite successful in managing our resources. And um, the photo that you showed in the beginning is a, is a good example of the, of the possibility of um, um, having sustainable livelihoods and conservation, um, um, ef conservation efforts. And um, I think that's what we want to achieve. Um, but th there, is, um, there, is, there is a lot of ill will regarding the Bolsonaro government. I mean, this is a government that doesn't have a year yet. And it's true that um, there have been some policy changes 
but he was, he was elected on a pro-business platform. And you may not like that, people may not like it, but that's, he, was, he, was, he is a democratically elected um, leader um, with a platform that he's trying to, to implement. Thank you. Uh, do you. Do you have a question to ask, Professor Hecht? I'm, I'm just finishing. Thank, Thank you. you very much. And um, I, because we think it's important to, to give um, our side of the, of, of the situation. And um, so, um, and you referred to budget cuts. These budget cuts were across the board in the, in the Brazilian government. It wasn't just affecting environmental agencies. And um, just lastly, <clears throat> there have been setbacks in, in deforestation efforts, but these setbacks precede the, the current government. They even go back to the, uh, the, the Workers' Party government. And this is something that people don't mention um, when they talk about um, Brazil and the Amazon. So it's, um, just to summarize, I think it's a, it's a very complex situation. And um, people need to, to, to realize it and not to, to, to give simplistic um, uh, portrayals of, of Brazil and our efforts, um, uh, conservation efforts. And I believe if you talk to any Brazilian, um, you know, conservation and sustainable um, values are deeply ingrained in our society. And it's not something that we will give up. Thank you. Um, first of all, I agree that the, uh, this is why I talked a little bit about leakage, that there was a certain amount of control in Amazonia, but not so much elsewhere. Second, I completely agree that um, under Mr. Temer, the, these policies move forward. Um, uh, I am not in any doubt that uh, President Bolsonaro was democratically elected. However, I think that the model of development that he is pursuing um, will be very problematic because of this closeness to the tipping point, in which case the model of development will be highly vulnerable to climate change. So I can't, you know, because I only had half an hour, I couldn't go into all the details. But I would also agree with you that Brazil's international environmental management had been its jewel in the crown of its diplomacy. It was extremely important and very well thought of. And the backlash is because these, uh, these deforestation dynamics were um, so intense. And just to be fair, um, Evo Morales wasn't getting any big points either at this time with his uh, permitting of um, the deforestation as, as much as possible. And even as the smoke was swirling around him in San Ignacio, he was sending off um, uh, uh, 92,000 tons of beef to China. So there's plenty of blame to go around. The question is, it's not, um, as, uh, as actually an Amazonian told me, because um, I talk to Amazonians quite regularly, actually, um, that feeding China's pigs is not our liberation. And I think that what, I think that this is a problematic thing to take one of the world's most complex ecosystem and turn it into just a few species. This is turning it into what the um, biologist E.O. Wilson calls the eremocene, the age of loneliness. Thank you. There was another question there, and then if you could just keep it short so we can have several people intervening. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, I'm Alexander uh, from the Brazilian Mission to WTO. Short, please. Thank you. Short. So thank you a lot for... Thank you a lot for your presentation, especially because of your background living in Brazil. And I also would like to know about the other fires that happen across the world, what uh, they can cause and how can we can manage to uh, reduce them. I mean, tropical forests in Africa and also in Asia. Thank you. Um, the Indonesian case is, is uh, one that is the most worrisome at this juncture. Um, partly because it occurred, the deforestation is again one of these monoculture development models, um, but also it occurs on these peat forests so that when they go, the peat keeps burning. So when you light it, you get these, these subterranean forests, uh, uh, soil fires that go, that often they never go out. 
So the, the idea of these monocultures, of course, is, uh, is sort of my large beef. These are, these are environments which actually have the potential for multiple forms of tropical development and, and with them forms of income and human development. It's the problem of plunder that is going on with a lot of this right now that makes me apprehensive. So it's not, I believe in environments, what I work on are tropical environments that are inhabited. I'm not, you know, and then it should, we should pretend that these are environments that never had people in them. We know from the archeology span that they were very densely populated. So my point really here is to say, it's not, it's not no development, it's the form of development. It's the form of engagement with the forest in ways that, um, that produce livelihood, income, and um, keep a forest standing. I didn't have time to show it, but I have a very interesting slide that shows for the state of Pará, uh, that the returns to acai are about double the returns to soy. And there, you know, acai isn't everywhere and soy isn't everywhere, but there's a lot more area in soy than there is in acai. So in an inhabited environment, like my first foresty slide, you can have a really good income. And I've known those, that, those areas for a long time and they're really, really much better under these conditions of global, globalized commodity markets, but they're globalized commodity markets within a complex environmental framing, not within the context of monocultures. Thank you. This lady here. Yes, thank you. I'm Elise Buckle. I work for the SDG lab here at the UN, and I was also working on nature-based solutions in the lead up to the Climate Action Summit in New York. Um, so my question is similar to what you said in the introduction. What is it that we could do here um, with the response we've heard from Bolsonaro that, you know, saying the, the forest is ours, please don't touch it from the outside. Um, I mean, when I was in New York, I actually spoke to um, a, a leader of an indigenous community who was telling me why well, the forest is not ours, it's not from Brazil, it's not... It's not uh, for the G7, it's actually the forest of humanity. So, um, so I don't know what we can do here in Geneva. I heard what you said about investments. We know that there are private investors here in Geneva that actually want to invest in the forest. So I wonder how that could be facilitated to support the kind of progressive forces in Brazil because there are people here, I mean, there are people in Brazil on the ground who want to save the forest. Um, so that's one option. The other things we're thinking of is also trying to uh, support other leaders, for example, Costa Rica, who are investing in forests and nature-based solutions, and there was no forest fire in Costa Rica in the summer. So also trying to kind of support the ones that are going in the right direction. But any other idea, welcome. Thank you. Well, there's, um, you know, for the, for the moment, I would say this idea of multiple modernities may be the way to go forward. Right now, also, if you look at things like RED, um, which is reduced emissions from deforestation and, and degradation, the cost of carbon is too low. If you're going to ask people, the opportunity, you know, I wouldn't stop doing anything I wanted to do for $30 and then told I couldn't use the forest for firewood or for you know, collecting or things like that. So one of the things is to rethink the international carbon price, I hate to say this, and also to think about what kind of policies might actually be useful. This clean supply chain stuff is a very useful mechanism. And that the, it's, it's kind of a perfected mechanism even though it has a lot of potential to be corrupted, but it's not nothing. The second thing is that there are a lot of tropical commodities, um, many of which are extremely enjoyed by the Swiss. I'm thinking of chocolate, of course. Um, and there are, I have a stu grad student who's just finishing up on looking at the shift from sugarcane into intensive cacao production on the Trans-Amazon in these incredible co complex coffee forests. And of course, the Brazilian Bahia is famous for its cabroca cacao. So that's, and that, that's a, been a very intensely intervened forest, but it's one where you actually have these kinds of models. Along toward um, uh, uh, Rondonia, you have also a lot of coffee and so on. And then when you get into Peru, you have a lot of, other, you, have, you have had a stronger coffee and cacao 
agroforestry development, as well as other minor crops and regional crops. So the other thing is people weren't, you know, some of this stuff is absolutely delicious, and there's no reason you couldn't use that, um, use them in, in national and international things. For lots of reasons, they are very nutritious. They've got a lot of um, antioxidants in them, so they become these fat and superfoods. So the other thing is if you want to go with small farmers, you kind of have to go with niche commodities. You can't go with the big commodities. They won't, they, they won't support, they're not value, valuable enough and they're too easy to produce elsewhere. So there's, there, are some, there are some models. A more agro-silvo-pastoral system than just those open brachiaria, th brachiaria things are, are options too in the cattle model. There's, um, I began working in livestock in Amazonia and the expansion of livestock, so I spent my entire life thinking about, well, you know, and I'm dismayed that it still is one of these things that has really low carrying capacities, one animal unit per hectare, a lot of soil and environmental degradation, when any time you go by a tree with, uh, in a pasture, all you see is all the cows underneath it. So one of the things is it's certainly possible to start rethinking some of these things. The other thing, of course, is perhaps it would make more sense to have protein out of water than protein out of land. This is one of the world's major fisheries. It has a long history of sustainable management. Um, if you go into places like uh, Ecuador, every little rural area has a fish pond. It's sort of like, um, you know, and it, it's tilapia, not my favorite. I'd rather be eating a surubing. But anyway, uh, my taste in fish is for those big river fishes. But anyway, the point being that there's other ways to produce protein than always with cattle. But, and, and fish don't really t need a lot of management, just like cattle. It's hard to herd fish, you know. Um, so I think that there's a lot of alternatives. I don't know how uh, open, and perhaps the, the, I can chat with the gentleman from the ministry afterwards, but I'm not exactly sure whether this is the moment, given the kind of um, uh, language that is being um, thrown around to discuss this, uh, but certainly it will soften with time. But the other thing is that there's lots of other options within the Amazon basin in which various kinds of, in, of governments and regional governments might be more amenable to various kinds of landscape options of rural development that would be more in line with the sustainable development goals. I uh, recently saw a film called Cowspiracy. I was trying to find some good films for our Cine Club series, and it's about the, the rise of the industry in the Amazon, and the <laughs> conclusion of the film was that we should change our eating habits radically. So I'm wondering whether that is one solution that one can put forward for change in the way that this land is being used. Um, well, I think that um, Brazilians like to eat meat. Um, I think that changing diets in Asia and the Middle East uh, support a lot of the global demand for Brazilian beef, and Brazilians like to eat their own beef, which is quite delicious, I have to say. Um, so the question is perhaps um, uh, if one, there certainly, <laughs> I was just reading in the New York Times about in the center of Bahia that there was a, the schools were going vegan, which, you know, kind of set me on my heels. And needless to say, it set everybody else there on their heels too. But um, so it was kind of amusing to read. But the point is that um, the livestock do a lot of things. They do a lot of things for small farmers. They do a lot of things for big landowners. One of the things is that they're not very labor demanding. So in a context where um, you have difficulty with uh, having labor out there, it's a useful thing. The other thing is it's both the product and the producer. So it produces as well as um, is the, product, the commodity itself. You can walk it to a market if you have to. It enjoys the prestige of the Luso-Brazilian history about land ownership and um, the sort of idea of what it means to be a gentleman to be a fazendero. So there's a lot of things that go on with it. It's not just an animal that for slaughter. It's not like a tilapia. I personally have no feelings about tilapia. We'll eat them until 
you know, you know, without a moment's hesitation. Uh, but um, but cattle ha are imbued with a lot of uh, with a lot of meaning of multiple types and also a lot of strategy. The other thing is that they're a very good placeholder until for land speculators. So if you want to cut forest but don't want to you don't want to do a lot of investment, you burn uh, you take out the valuable wood, slice down the rest of the forest, burn it, and throw grass on it. It's relatively inexpensive. You can hit the big peak of productivity in the first five years and then sell it. So it creates an asset. And then if you didn't have to buy the land and can do the cattle with credit, although they were blacked out in many cases. So one of the dynamics in this is speculation. The other thing is cattle are also used in many areas more toward the west and also in Peru and Ecuador and Bolivia as a way of money laundering too. So they do a lot of things in those landscapes. They're not just producing meat. Thank you. Any other question? Yes, this gentleman in the front. Hello. Hi. Uh, my, nom my name is Luis Henrique. Uh, I'm vegetarian. I <laughs> work at the Brazilian uh, uh, <laughs> Brazilian Minister of Agriculture. And uh, first, um, I have uh, just one very brief question, but I, I'd like to, to, to comment what uh, the lady said here before. According to uh, the lady, Bolsonaro said uh, the Amazon is all, then we can do whatever. But the, maybe we, I, 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 I would like to say something that we maybe uh, can lead us to think about. And if you look at the world map, and 4,000 years ago, Brazil uh, had around 6% uh, of the whole primary forest in the world. So 4,000 years ago, 6.5%. It's around this. And can you guess how much Brazil or uh, hold today? Almost 30%. What it means? All the words, the countries in the world, they, you cut your forest and we keep our forest. That makes or you think about that. Maybe uh, I think the lady well, left. left. Yeah, but then let's, let's take it in mind and, and think about this. And, uh, but my, my question is, I saw one picture, and maybe the last one, or it was uh, a picture from Sao Paulo, mm -hmm. and sh showing Sao Paulo in the dark, and 4 p.m. 4 p.m. in Brazil is always sun, okay? Or, uh, when, or at least when we have sun, or it could be rainy. And that day in Sao Paulo, it was rainy. It was a very dark rainy. It wasn't. Uh, uh, dash from from ash from uh, from the from the Amazon. I'm living in Brasilia. Brasilia, it's the middle of Brazil. Brasilia is uh, at least two thousand kilometers far from the Amazon. São Paulo, probably another two. It's it means not one thousand, but at least four thousand kilometers from Amazon. So, I'm sorry, but it's impossible. You see this because I'm living in the middle. I've never seen this. And so my question is, can you provide the scientific justification that prove that ash was from Amazon in that picture? Uh, it may not have been from the Brazilian Amazon. It was probably from the Bolivian Amazon. And I, I can show you the, um, the remote sensing images. If you give me the thing, I, because I work with somebody at JPL who sends me these, these little things. So, and you're absolutely right. There was a, there, there were, it was a confluence of a very dark storm, but also with the ash. So it, it, but the point is that, look, I live in California. You can't breathe while those forests are burning either up there. You know, and it's, I, you know, and, and no one is setting those for any, for any purpose whatsoever. It's an accidental fire. So um, uh, the point about problems in breathing and problems in ash, and it's very dark. It's <laughs> very dark in lots of in San Francisco during these big burning periods too. 
Um, so one of the things is, and, and also if you look at the pictures of Porto Velho, they're very dark as well. So, and uh, other areas also. So the point is, when you start to burn up a lot of forests, you get a lot of ash. And I'm sure that we'll be able to get, figure, get the signature of this in the sediments as well. Uh, to your point about that 4,000 years ago, um, there was X amount of, um, of forest in Amazonia. I'm a great believer in the indigenous pattern of forest construction. I actually think that most Amazonian forests are anthropogenic forests, that they come out of human history and human management. So I don't have, again, I don't have a problem with people interacting and creating forests. In fact, if you look throughout the tropics, what you see is people tend to clear for monocultures, but around them, they like to have forests because it's cooler, it has more stuff for them. Uh, it, they're beautiful. You know, I mean, they're, they're nice things as well. Um, but also, there has been climate change, too. And what is often argued in these by paleoecologists and stuff is that, in fact, basically, Amazonia, you're right, Amazonia was a lot more open um, in, in the past, and that the forest that we see now is kind of at its maximum extension and that it would probably be retracting under climate change anyway. But the other thing that we're seeing is accelerated climate change to which that forest is really quite vulnerable. And this problem of the tipping point is, um, is one, because the forest can maintain itself if it's not overly cleared around it. So, the, so again, my point is not that um, a forest should never have people in them, I think, People make forests all the time. The reason, um, uh, you know, that that's that's actually in some ways more more a tropical form of development, a tropicalizing development through the creation of forests over history, over historical time. But my argument is not that people. Again, this is not. I don't take the argument that forests should be empty. I think forests should be full of people doing things, and have uh, access to. Uh, the kinds of education, healthcare, and other kinds of social services that make it possible and pleasant to live there rather than to live there in penury. However, that's not the same as saying the development model that is best for that region is a monoculture, and I, I really don't believe that. And also, just as a point, too, as long as, as, long as you're a vegetarian, uh, only 6% of soy is globally is eaten by people. The rest goes to livestock. So we could be th rethinking the livestock consumption dynamic as well. Yes, thank you very much. I think our time is out. I thank you very much, uh, Susanna, oh, for sharing you. this. Are uh, you available for a few minutes? Yes, if anybody yeah, yeah. wants to ask you further questions, these gentlemen or anyone else. Yes, and thank you for coming. Thank you very much, all, for so attending. Much.